Welcome to Nuggies. In this short video, we're going to create and train a deep learning model in Keras. In order to create our Hello World of Deep Learning, we're going to first import Keras and define some parameters. Then we're going to load the MNIST dataset. We'll build and train the model. And then we're going to evaluate our model performance. Finally, just for fun, we're going to overfit the model to our training data and see what that looks like. If this is what you're looking for, please hit that like button. It only takes a second and really helps other users find my content. Okay, before we get started, I'm going to quickly show my environment. This is the environment I'm running. I'll be running TensorFlow through Docker. If you haven't already set up your environment or you don't know what your environment's gonna be, you probably wanna check out my other video. There's a link in the description on how to set up this environment. So this is the Docker file and we're using Docker Compose. And all we have to do is run Docker Compose up. and it's just that easy. So I'm gonna use my notebook that I've already put together. If you wanna download the code, there's a link to my repo in the description. However, I strongly encourage you to type the code yourself so you have a better chance of learning it. Of course, we're going to initially do some imports here, but we're, we're gonna import OS just to set an environment variable to disable the warnings in TensorFlow. There's a lot of unnecessary warnings and you don't really need to see them unless you run into problems and you want a more robust set of data. We're gonna import Keras from, from TensorFlow. We're gonna import matplotlib just for one simple plot. Here we define the batch size. This is how much of the training data we're gonna to send to the GPU at once. This small data set, this should not be a problem for anyone. If for some reason your GPU runs out of memory, you can always reduce this number. This is the layer size. It's pretty random and you can choose a different number and experiment with it and see how your model performance changes. Same thing with the number of layers. The reason I built the model up this way is so you can tweak and change the layer size and the number of layers very easily. You can also modify the batch size to see how that affects your performance. So I wanted to put these right up front uh, so you can kind of experiment and play around on your own. So let's go ahead and run this first section. So we'll we'll load and then create our parameters. The next thing we want to do is load our MNIST dataset. This is included with Keras. It may need to download if this is the first time you're using the dataset, but it will do that automatically. So we're going to assign our dataset to a train and test split, and the Keras datasets loader does that automatically. Next thing we're gonna do is just display some of the information about our uh, training data. So you can see the shape of the training data is 60,000. So there's 60,000 samples and it, they're images that are 28 by 28 pixels. And we'll display a few of those in a moment. So the dimensions of each image is 28 by 28. The set contains 60,000 images. The test set contains 10,000 images. So about one seventh of our data, of course, is in the test set then. Let's take a look at a few of these images. So you can see we have handwritten digits. That's what the MNIST dataset is. So we have 504, 192, 131, and we can print out the expected value of these. So X is the training data that we're going to use. These are the inputs, the images, and Y is the value that we expect to get out. So we can display these nine numbers, what they're actually supposed to be. And you can see that they're pretty human readable. I mean, it's not, it's not that hard to, to match these up for us. But the next thing we're gonna do is build a model that can look at these images and determine what number it is displaying. In this step, we're gonna build our model. The code here is a little bit overcomplicated just because I wanted to be able to change the number of layers at the top of the file and then have it create that. This is a little bit of Python and I'll break it down. The real thing we're looking at here is the layer. This is just a dense layer and it's that layer size that we defined at the beginning of the file. The activation function is ReLU. Uh, you'll almost always choose this over Sigmoid. There are papers on it and things like that. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but ReLU is better than Sigmoid in almost every case. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do a list comprehension, which is what this first bracket here is for. And for the number of layers, we're going to just add another layer. So that way at the top of the file, you can define number of layers and we'll put that many dense layers in this and create a deep learning model. And this asterisk here, all that does is break apart this list and insert it into this other list that we're creating. So just a little bit of Python, but I did want to kind of talk my way through it here. So we can define a number of layers at the top of the file. We define the layer size at the top of the file, and then this will build those layers into this sequential model. This final layer is going to be a softmax activation, and this 10 has to match the number of classifications here. So the size of this softmax needs to be the size needs to match the number of classifications that you have. And we have the digits zero through nine, so there's 10 different items. And then what softmax does is it 
takes the exponential of the value and divides it divides it by the sum of the exponentials of all 10 values. Essentially, it limits the output value to be between zero and one, and the sum of all 10 different output values is going to total to one. So in a sense, we get a probability out of this model for each value. So each individual output zero through nine will have a probability associated with it, and that's what the model thinks the probability of the classification item is. This step just compiles it. We're gonna choose the Atom Optimizer. It's very popular. There are several other options out there that would be outside of the scope of a first model. The sparse categorical cross entropy is for the classification model of this. It's just a, a way of scoring the loss for a classification model. And for the metrics, we're gonna use accuracy. That'll allow us to easily score the 10,000 images in our test set. Accuracy is essentially the number correct divided by the number of items. The last thing we need to do is prep our training data. We're actually gonna reshape it into a vector instead of a 28 by 28 image. We're not doing any convolution layers or anything like that, so we really don't need it to maintain its shape. And then we're gonna convert it into floats because they're currently integer values, uh, the RGB color code. And then we're gonna divide by 255 because in RGB, every color, or in this case, grayscale, has a value between zero and 255. And we want this to be a float between zero and one. Normally you prep your data to be around zero and be small values, or you run into big problems while you're training with large value numbers. So let's go ahead and run these. We're gonna create our model. We're gonna compile our model. We're going to prep our data. And then let's go ahead and take a look at our data shape now. So you see that our test set is still 10,000 items, but instead of being 28 by 28, like we had up here, it used to be 28 by 28. Now we just have 784 values in a vector. Finally, we can call model.fit. This batch size should be batch size. And we're gonna train it for five epics. You should notice the loss going down. What this is doing is trying to optimize this loss value down to zero. So down to a loss of zero would mean you have a perfect fit of your, your data, which will never happen. And then accuracy should be increasing as we continue to improve our model. We would expect the accuracy to be better and better. Now we can perform some predictions on the, the test set. We can look at a few of those predictions. So the first line here is our predictions. We predicted 72104145. And the true values actually match that. So we did get 100% of our initial values right. However, we don't know if all of the test set data is being accurately predicted. On the training set, we're only seeing about 99% accuracy. We're pretty close to 99% accuracy on the, the training data. But on our test data that the model hasn't seen yet, we do want to run that and score it. So you can see that we're only ju we're just shy of 98%. And that's normal for there to be a little bit of a gap here. This is kind of what you would consider overtraining. Whenever your training set data is performing much better than your test set data, that would be overfitting. However, this is not that bad. What we want to do is train this model a lot more and see if we can really see some overfitting here. So what we're gonna do is train this for another 15 epics, and we should see that accuracy continue to improve. For the most part, it may bounce around a little bit, but in general, it's going to improve. It may actually hit perfect accuracy. So we'll just have to wait and see. So close. So the accuracy on the training data is now 99.69%. Nice. And let's take a look at our test set data to see how well it improved. You can see that our accuracy on the test set data is 98.1, and previously we had 97.79. It barely improved, only a little bit, but our training data improved a whole digit here. So you can see that it's suffering a little bit more overfit at this point because the training data is nearly perfect, and you can keep running this thing and running this, and eventually you might find a, a value that performs better on your test data, but if you do that, you're actually overfitting to your test data because you're look, basically looking at a bunch of random results until you find a good one for your test data, and then you choose it, and that doesn't mean it will ex extrapolate to another sample or another bunch of test data. Well, that does it for running a Hello World in Deep Learning. Hopefully this video has been helpful for you. If it has, be sure to like the video. If you want to see more TensorFlow and Keras Nuggies, be sure to subscribe to the channel and throw a comment down in the description. Thanks for watching and see you next time.